Welcome back class. This lecture has a few different goals to it. We're going to do a quick review of natural selection and evolution. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about what's a phenomenon called group selection, or actually the problem with group selection, as in does it really ever exist? I'll tell you the answer now, that's no. Um, I'm going to go over scientific method a little bit. And finally, um, a big thing that I want you to learn today is something called proximate and ultimate causation. Now you should have gotten most of this from having gone through the UC Berkeley Fundamentals of Evolution site, um, or Evolution 101, but I really want to go over some of the basic steps in natural selection. So one of the first things that we can see and what's being demonstrated in these photographs here is the idea that populations vary, that individuals within populations can vary. So here are some lady beetles, all of the same species. Okay, so this is a population. You might recall that a population consists of individuals of the same species, okay, but that they can vary in some way. And not only is there variation, but at least some of that variation is due to genetic differences. Okay, we know that phenotypes are all a combination of both genes and environment, <laughs> as we recall, but that the variation, these differences that we see here in our lady beetle types, um, should be due at least in part, and perhaps some substantial part, to genetics. And so that's why we talk about the variation being heritable, or some of the variation in this population is heritable. And, that, and that's where we start. So if these traits confer a selective advantage, and you can see right here, here's the lady beetle with spots and one without, and um, what we're imagining is at least five different generations going on here. Okay, and so what it is that we're seeing is that some of these beetles are getting wiped out. You can see the... Um, little uh, X's here mean that they've been killed. Perhaps we can imagine a bird predator has come in and uh, eaten these guys. Okay, and so first of all we can see, you know, where is most of the um, mortality taking place? And you can see it's these spotted beetles that are getting eaten more frequently than the solid co color beetle. We also see differences in reproduction. Okay, so the ones that survive get to reproduce they continue to reproduce, and then after many generations, what's happening is that we have a greater frequency, a greater number of the total number of uh, plain beetles compared to spotted beetles by the fifth generation. And so we see right away what it means to have differential survival, okay, as well as differential reproduction. Differential survival and reproduction, meaning it's different between spotted and not spotted, and that the spotted ones um, are being selected against quite heavily so that by the fifth generation they actually go extinct. All right, and then the ones that are plain are, are for some reason not seen by the predators. Again, this is an imaginary example, and they're not, not only surviving better, but they're reproducing more. Okay, so over here is really the kicker because what we've started with was a 50 50 percentage of spotted to not spotted, and then we see it goes from 40 60, 30 70, 10 90 to finally zero. So it's actually this change in the relative frequency of these genes are these genotypes for different traits that have changed in the population over time. Okay, that is the very definition of evolution. That's what evolution is. It's the change in the frequency of genotypes within a population over successive generations. So just to recap and to remind you, what it is here, what changes is the relative frequency of genes, okay? And what natural selection acts on is the individual, okay? So it's the individual with its spots or with its solid bright red color that's being selected upon, okay? And in this example, our selective agent was some kind of a bird predator, Right, so natural selection acts on the individuals, but the evolutionary change occurs where? Let me pause so you can say it out loud to yourself. 
right? Evolutionary change occurs in the population. Okay. And again, so we say, all right, so what is evolution? Evolution is the genetic changes in a population, right? In a population over time or over many generations. Okay, assuming that in, over time, lots of generations have occurred. The genetic changes in population over time, that is the very definition of what evolution is. And there's no debate about whether it happens or not. It's easily observed. You can observe it in a laboratory over 20 generations if you take fruit flies and select them for different characters. Okay. Okay, I want to continue with looking at this um, concept known as group selection. Uh, which kind of dates back to the 50s and 60s, and especially with regard to behavioral traits, people often believe that sometimes animals did things for the good of the species, meaning that they would engage in certain behaviors that would be beneficial to the population. Okay, and we can ask the question, can this behavior really evolve? So sometimes they may do things that seem to be very helpful, like warn others that a predator is coming, um, but at sacrifice to themselves because the predator will then zero in on them. Okay, so I'm talking about this um, in the other lecture called altruism. Okay, but other times within the, within the category or the concept of thinking about how population size is regulated, often people would imagine that there would be populations that would get too large Okay, and that there wouldn't be enough food to go around. And so some individuals would just stop reproducing. Okay, just stop having babies. Some individuals, some of the females would just not develop um, the ability to get pregnant. Okay, or they would um, stop ovulating. And then this would help to regulate the size of the population. Okay, <clears throat> and that um, th this idea is that can, can this really evolve? This is the question. Can this behavior really evolve? Because if you look at it, if you think about it in terms of how evolution occurs, if an individual stops reproducing, okay, then it's not going to have any offspring, right? And if the genes for controlling your ability to reproduce <laughs> are not passed along, then how can that trait be passed along? You see where I'm see where I'm driving at the idea that um, it's individuals that become selected, not the whole group. Like doing things for the good of the species, can those behaviors really be maintained? So we always have to think about it in terms of what are the benefits to the individual? Because if the individual is selected for or against, it's that individual that's going to pass its genes along to future generations. I want to talk now a little bit about a behavior um, where animals sometimes kill infants within their groups, this infanticide. I know this looks really sad, like this male lion killed this baby, and that seems really sad. And so we're going to try not to anthropomorphize this too much, all right? Although we can talk about humans and how the killing of children does happen in human populations, but I'm not going to, I'm not going to actually address that right now. Okay, so infanticide. What I want to do is use this as a way of illustrating both um, the scientific method in terms of how do behavioral scientists go about using the scientific method in order to address questions about behavior and its evolution. Okay, and I also want this to be a lead in to something called proximate and ultimate causation. I'm going to come back to that in a bit. So infanticide is in fact actually fairly uh, widespread among the animal kingdom and not even just among mammals, but ab among insects and some other groups. And so again, it seems really sad. Here's these um, uh, langurs, which also you'll see males come into these troops and sometimes come and kill some of the babies. And so we can ask the question, um, do langurs commit infanticide as a means of population regulation? Okay, again, is this an example of group selection? If you kill some of the babies within the population, the population won't get so big. Okay, and so population regulation becomes one of the alternative hypotheses to explain infanticide. But as I've already alluded to, 
does this really make sense? Can, can this evolve? And you might think about it for a minute and, and, and we're going to try to use the scientific method to actually address the question. But first I want you to think about the idea again, I, I know I'm harboring or har harping on this rather, that natural selection acts on individuals, okay? And who is it that survives and reproduces, okay? It's individuals that survive and then they're the ones that reproduce, although those cause changes in the genetic makeup of the population, okay? But what would happen to a cheater? What happens to those lions that don't kill infants? Okay, they're expending a lot of energy. In fact, it's costly. You, they, the, the male lions or the male langurs or rodents or whichever that are doing this actually um, incur quite a bit of uh, energetic cost in order to kill an infant. They have to fight off the females because the females aren't usually going to sit around and allow it to happen. So it becomes dangerous. They can actually get killed. Okay, so why are they exhibiting this behavior, which is a cost and a risk to themselves? Okay, just to benefit the species. And in fact, if, if he's putting too much energy and risk into doing this, he's going to have less time to mate and pass his genes along. Okay, so is this behavior really going, going to evolve? This cartoon just kind of illustrates this idea about cheaters. You know, here's the classic example of um, lemmings that throw themselves off a cliff in order to keep the population size down. And, and people actually believed this, that there would be populations of rodents like lemmings that would get too large. And so some of them would just kind of jump off a cliff and keep the population size down and there'd be plenty of food for everybody else. Um, but here, this guy over here is actually illustrating a genotype uh, he's got the little um, uh, inner tube on here, so he's going to survive, right? Who's going to survive? Okay, and, and, and if you survive, who's going to reproduce? So if, you, if you've got these sort of cheaters in the population, an evolutionary cheater, meaning a genotype that doesn't go along with the behavior, you know, who's going to pass their genes on to the next generation and the next generation and the next generation? So we can imagine that populations are going to be composed of individuals that are doing things that benefit their own survival and reproduction, not to benefit the group. Okay, and so group selection as a concept doesn't really hold up now very well, does it? I'm gonna I'm gonna write group selection here. I'm gonna put a big red X through it because, um, except for in some very specialized circumstances, which we're not gonna get into in this class. Okay, 99.9999999 percent of the time, group selection does not operate. Okay. So let's go over the six basic steps in hypothesis testing in the scientific method. So making observations is, is the first most important thing, determining what your question is. Then from the question, actually stating this as a hypothesis, as to try to, which is an answer, a possible answer to your question. Okay, hypotheses have to be testable. So the possible answer to your question has to be something that you're able to test in some way. Okay, um, making predictions, which we usually do in if-then statements, and then we design, conduct, and analyze experiments. And, and finally, we evaluate whether or not the hypothesis was supported or not.